Check it out. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to draw graffiti digitally, take some of my digital designs, put them on a hoodie, and even a poster. Let's go. We're going to start off on the iPad in a software called Procreate. Here are some sample designs I've made in the past using it. To start a new drawing, I'll hit the plus icon at the top right, and then I'll do a new canvas over here. I like to set mine up in inches just because it's a little bit more realistic to know what size it is. And I'll do 11 by 17 there. So 17 inches wide and a height of 11 inches. I would recommend a minimum of a 300 DPI. The higher you go there, the better resolution your file will have and the bigger you can scale it without noticing. Now that we have our dimensions all set up, we can choose our color profile. You have two main selections here, RGB or CMYK. The main difference here is if you want to do only digital work, you're going to upload this online, it's just a logo or something, RGB will work fine. But if you plan to actually reproduce the artwork as in a sticker or a poster, CMYK will be the better option. The letters here in CMYK stand for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So this comes from the actual printer that might be used to reproduce your artwork. So it might have that cartridge for cyan, might have a cartridge for magenta, yellow, and black, and then it'll combine those colors to make the actual print on the paper or the sticker. So I generally use CMYK, so the visual on here is really, really close to what the end print will be. And then you can get create. 11 by 17 is nice because it's just about the same aspect ratio as my iPad here. So up here on the top right is your tools panel. This first icon is your brush library. So based on how you want to draw or what you want to draw, you can pick something in here that'll match your style and, and help you get there. My favorite to get started with is the mono line inside the calligraphy category. This one's a great bold, just perfectly circular line. Jumping over here to the eraser, you can actually pick the same brush or a different brush depending on how you want to erase your lines. Next up we have the layers panel. By default you have the layer one right there and then your background color. Here you can see layer one is selected in blue and that means that's where our drawing is actually going to reside. We can have multiple layers as we go, but we'll start with just the one. Make sure I've got my correct brush selected. Let's zoom in and have a little tag. So there we go, looks nice and smooth. So if we jump back into our brush library, we can actually edit the mono line to change some of its features. So right here in the brush studio, you get full suite of options, but we'll just tweak a few and kind of introduce how you can change things. Our first option here is spacing. So as we drag that larger, we'll actually see that the line itself is only able to be printed so often. You know, there's spacing now in between each time that circle is made. So if we go like midway, you can see that the spacing has now gotten closer, but you have all these ridges. So take that into effect. If it's a style you want to use where you're kind of dotting across the way, could be a cool use. If you want a solid straight line, drop that spacing all the way down so the line is perfectly printed one next to the other. Jitter is a fun one where it actually spreads your line all the way out into like a scatter. So it almost gives you like a flare look to your drawing. So you could get some, definitely some spray paint effects in there. With the jitter throwing our dots all over the place makes our line pretty thick. So here on the left side, we can actually drag this top slider down to reduce the overall size. And you can see we get a, something that you might actually be able to make a tag with. The last one in the stroke path is fall off and you can see our line preview is shortening up there and basically it means we're only allowed to draw a line so long and then it kind of fades it off. So no matter what I do, my line's only going to be, you know, those two inches long. So this is something cool if you're doing like hair or something where you like stuff to kind of shoot off and slowly fade off, you can get some really nice effects with that. So although you have all those parameters to tweak, I don't use them here with the mono line much. I tend to just put them all to none, and then I use a little bit of stability in my line. So now that we have some added stabilization on the brush, watch to see it kind of lag behind my drawing. Especially in these big, long swirl parts, it kind of averages out the path a little bit, so it really does have a smooth line, but it might not be as accurate to the actual stroke that I wanted originally. To further exemplify this, if I crank it all the way up, it totally distorts the drawing. Like, come on, just look at how funny that E and the I are because they move so much, it's really just averaging far too much in there. So I like to have a little bit of smoothing on, you know, maybe around 10 or 15%, but nothing all the way at the max. 
That way it's really close to my actual path with also giving me a little added bonus of smoothing things out and making it nice and even. So another classic brush for tags is a chisel tip and that doesn't actually come so standard. So let's walk through making our own custom brush. Select your brush library and then if you scroll down in the calligraphy folder, you can see one called brush pen. Slide that to the left and hit duplicate. Once again, I'm gonna put my spacing jitter and fall off all the way down to none. I'll actually crank down the stabilization a little bit from the default. In the taper menu, I'll drag the pressure taper size all the way to the right and left, and then I'll go for the same on the touch taper as well. And what this will do is actually keep the edges really square. Now in the shape panel, you can see we don't have a perfect circle anymore. If you scroll down in this little XY plot, you can drag the blue circles in a little bit and then rotate it 45 degrees or so, and that'll match your natural drawing shape of a chisel tag. Now the end of that sample line still look a little bit funny, so we'll jump over to the Apple Pencil, and we'll actually have to turn down the size and the flow all the way to zero. Size makes sure to keep a nice square edge all the way through your stroke, and then flow makes sure to keep a fully opaque stroke the whole way through, just like a marker. And lastly, I can name my brush down in the About This Brush panel. Yeah, that chisel tag's looking real sweet. Let's clear off our workspace here and try out a throwy. I'm gonna go over here to the layers panel, and then if I just click the check mark next to my layer, it'll hide it. I can then hit the plus sign, and that'll make me a new layer, and I can work from here. And then you can close that panel by clicking the top icon. And let's jump over here to our color panel, and we can actually pick a new color to work with. Click that again to get rid of it. Let's double check. Let's go back over to monoline. Make sure we got a fair amount of stability on there. And you don't actually have to color anything in. You can just drag your little color dot from the top down onto your piece. After you drag your first fill, you can actually hit the continue filling option, and then everywhere you press, it'll fill that entire region with the same color. This can definitely help speed things up a bit. Now you won't necessarily have perfect regions every time depending on how your layers line up, so a little bit of cleanup to follow. I'm gonna jump back to my yellow line and cut back on some of the overlaps that I made. Now the current image here is actually made up of every layer in the stack. Since we only have one visible, that's all we're seeing. If we make our other one visible, you can see our newest layer is actually on top of the previous and it covers everything up. We can use that same method here if we wanna draw behind our original shape. So I'll just hit the plus icon to get us a new layer. And then if I hold down on layer three, I can drag that below layer two. With it still selected blue, that means that's the active layer that I'll be drawing on. I can head back to my drawing. And now I can actually draw, and you see it just pokes out behind my original layer. There's no way for me to draw on top of it. So now all I have to worry about is getting below the original outline, and then we'll have a nice, consistent, and perfectly lined up force field. Awesome, that's looking great. We did get a little close to the edge up here, so if we go back to our layer and right swipe on both our layers, we can group them together. And then with that group, we can come up here and select our kind of pointer icon, and we can drag and scale that, move it around, as a group together. So now this new group can, you know, you might rename it, call it the whole throwy. Now you have that as a little package deal. Now for whatever reason, if you don't need the two layers separated from one another anymore, you can actually click on the image itself and then you can merge down. And basically what that'll do is that'll combine both layers to one single flat layer and your force field is now pretty much embedded in the actual throwy in the outline. So your personal preferences with layer management and naming everything will just come with time, so don't get too worried about your organization. As you get working through this, you'll definitely learn kind of what best works for you and your process. I also want to show off some pencil sketching and shading too. Let's set up a new layer. Over in the sketching one, I like to use the technical pencil. And then I'll turn that to black so it shows up nice. A cool feature about the technical pencil is your pressure depending on how hard you press, changes the thickness of the line. So you get actually some pretty dynamic and 
honest use of an actual real pencil. Dropping the transparency down a little bit also keeps it a little bit more true to a real pencil where you can build up the gray and get a really, really dark color if you keep going over the line a few times or your first pass can be light and sketchy and it doesn't have to be totally, totally black. So I like to start my pencil sketches with a nice structured line of my letter, and then I'll build up my boxes around that center line. This gives me a good baseline for the letter, and then it'll allow me to embellish on top of it so I can add hookups and extensions without muddying that original structure. I like to use the monoline brush for my eraser. That allows me to clean things up after I've sketched an area to death, and it gets a really nice bold white afterwards. If you press with two fingers on your layer, it'll bring up the opacity option, and then you can slide your pen across the window to drop that opacity down. That allows me to see the new strokes of my outline a little bit better. One of my favorite features to the pen tool is if you draw a line and leave your pen on the screen, it'll then snap to be a perfectly straight line. You can drag that endpoint around and you can see the angle changing. This really helps me on some of my more square sections where I really want to make sure the line's perfect. It was hard for me to get used to drawing like this because it's so different from real drawing, but after plenty of pieces now, I feel pretty comfortable with it. So the original width of my outline stroke was pretty skinny. I'm gonna go back and double up or add some extra thick sections in different parts of my letter to give a little bit more dynamics to the outline. All right, we got the outline in 3D in there. Now it's time to start doing some fill. It's best practice to fill on a separate layer than your outline. This will help keep your final design a little more organized. Going to our outline layer, let's swipe to the right and you'll see an option that says set as reference. This will allow us to fill within all the lines we just drew, but on a separate layer. Now if we drag our color fill over to an empty region, it'll fill that up. You can repeat the process for all the other areas of your fill, and you can look here and see that the fill doesn't overlap anywhere that the outline was, and they're now on separate layers. We can repeat that process for our 3D. So keeping our outline as the reference, we'll make a new layer, and then drag and drop some grays into the 3D sections. So I also like to keep my 3D separate from my fill, so when I go to shade my 3D, it doesn't overlap any of my fill colors. Now that we have some filled sections on our 3D layer, we can actually start shading on it. If you right swipe again and select Alpha Lock, what this will allow me to do is shade exclusively in the regions that already have color. This makes shading go really fast without any fear of it bleeding into other areas. It's simply locked within those original shapes. And I'll use that same process when I'm adding details to my fill layer. That way these new details don't go beyond the fill region that I've defined. Just like our throwy, I'll do a layer below everything for my force field. This will make sure that the force field is all the way in the background and doesn't overlap any of the letter. A few extra bubbles and bits and we're good to go. I hope this goes to show the variety that you can really get out of Procreate, anything from a simple tag to a couple little smooth layers and then full kind of shading and style in a piece. So I used only a few brushes here, so this is just the surface of the app's capabilities, but it should hopefully show you a few things that you can get into. And here's a picture of my most recent like use of Procreate. The print result of this piece came out so in line with the actual digital design. Colors are all matching up and all the blending came out really, really nice. So with Procreate, you can get some really high quality outcomes, even if you're going for printed media afterwards. On the iPod, I've actually been using some other apps as well. This one in particular is called Adobe Fresco, and it's actually free to use. The main difference with Adobe Fresco is you can actually work in vector formats as well. Let's jump into some of these files and see how they work. So vector file formats most commonly used for solid colored fill. If you know your end designs like a logo or it's something that doesn't need any shading, it's gonna be a great choice. Here on my slime throw design, all my greens are solid, there's no shading. I have you know, a little drop shadow down underneath the layer, but that's all a solid color as well. So you don't have to worry about all the blending and whatnot that I did in that piece. And similarly in the sprite design, you can see as we get all the way in here, all these are still solid colors. And so depending on your artwork style, vector is gonna be an awesome choice if you can work with just solid colors only. The word vector has a cool definition that actually illustrates how these lines work a little bit differently than before. So a vector is defined as a line that has direction and scale to it. So here this line's you know, about an inch long and then it's going just horizontal. In a similar case, if we draw a line that's about an inch long and do it at an angle, these two lines are actually very different to the computer. So it's saying, you know, this line's always gonna be going up at an angle for every inch or so we go over, we go up an inch, whereas this line, for every inch we go over, we don't go up at all or down at all, we're just horizontal. And so because the computer has the understanding of where this line is, its exact size, and its direction, you can zoom in forever, 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 and you'll never actually see a pixel. 
that's because the computer's remaking this image every time you see it. So if I zoom in this close, it's remaking that line, saying this line's going across the screen that way. And the same is true as you spin it. Now it's able to rotate those things without losing any resolution. And so even with complex shapes, the computer is able to reproduce that with ease and you'll have perfect quality no matter how big you look at it. Now that scaling feature to vectors is one of their best attributes because you could take this exact image and blow it up as big as a billboard and you'll never lose resolution. Or you could scale it down so small that it's perfect for a t-shirt and it'll still look as good as it does right now on the screen. So I like to think about vectors as more of like a design rather than just an image that you're making for a one-off case. So over on the left-hand side, we have our toolbar here. The third one down is gonna be our vector brush. If you click on that, you can get your color selection right there, and get your size, and then you can even get your smoothing just like over in Procreate. I'm just gonna be using the basic round brush here, but like I said, you know, mess around with this, see what fits your style, and have fun with it. I'm gonna start here with a black outline and a fair bit of smoothing, just to keep the throwy nice and even. Once you have your outline there, it's best to make your fill color on a separate layer. So if you bring up your layers panel over on the right hand side and click on your outline layer, select the set as reference button. So let's make a new layer and drop it below. This one will be for all our fills. That'll allow you to use all the lines in this layer as reference inside another layer. And now if we go select our paint bucket tool, we can drop it on the interior. On a new layer, you'll see the pop-up asking if you want to make it a vector fill or a raster fill. We're going to want to keep it as a vector here so it's easy to edit and it matches all our other layers. And as you see it, do some cleanup with your eraser and make sure those lines are nice and smooth. Making a layer below all the rest, we can make our force field without intersecting with our fill or our outline that we previously made. I think I'll also include a really dark yellow drop shadow on this. I forgot to include some drips, so let's go back up to our outline layer. We can just erase away a little drip path, and then making our outline a little bit smaller, we can add that outline on there. Now that I've come and gone from the outline layer, the fill layer is missing some of that green. If I were to fill the entire thing, you'll see I'll lose all those dots I drew, so I'm just going to draw in the extra green space that I just made. A little extra drop shadow and we're in business. So you can see, nothing looks better than just the perfectly smooth line, especially with a throwy. I've had so much fun designing and working with these lately. So you saw me jump in between the pen and the eraser over here, but this little white icon down here is an awesome feature as well. So if I go and draw a line here and I double click on that, it'll actually convert my pen to an eraser in the exact same size and smoothing that I'm using when I draw. So that is a quick, you know, double tap in and out so you can get your eraser out, adjust your lines a little bit, and, and get, you know, your piece moving really quickly. So it's a great efficiency. Another cool feature is there's actually a triple tap version of that as well. So if I draw my line here and I have two intersecting lines, I'll triple tap and kind of get my blue icon towards the exterior of the circle. I can then draw that path and it'll chop that line perfectly where the two line edges intersect. And I can also take this one off and now I have a perfect corner. So this is awesome feature for anything I'm doing in my pieces when I want two lines to really get a nice corner to them. This is such a great tool because you don't have to go in and meticulously erase each little edge. You can just really quickly go around and chop everything down. I've been working with this feature a ton in mastering my wild style alphabet. Let's check some of that out. So here I have just a black and white image of my alphabet. You can make a new layer and start working on it. I'll probably drop the transparency down on this background image so my black shows up a little bit better. You can find that over here in the layers property section. So jumping up to this A, let's make sure we got a good deal of smoothing on there so our lines are nice and even. Definitely way too big. It's looking pretty good. And now see, it does get a lot to take used to to draw past all your edges like this. But then, when I triple tap, my corner is perfectly made. You know, since this line goes all the way across, I found it's best to draw your lines, even if they have big intersections, draw them all the way to where they need to be so that you can guarantee this left side and that right side are perfectly in line. So I won't go too far without chopping some of these down so I don't get too lost in the image. So you can see here on this crossbar, I actually drew it all the way to where it terminates on the far side. That also helps keep these sections on the left in line with the sections on the right. So now when I draw these vertical lines that chop it out, I can trim those down. That way I don't have to worry that the left side isn't perfectly aligned with the right. They were all part of that original line and now they have perfect corners too. 
You can see I probably didn't draw this line long enough over here. So when I go to trim it, I may actually lose that whole line. So that's because this curve doesn't go high enough into that area. So since I'd rather not back up and reproduce this entire line, I'm just gonna come in with the eraser and finesse it so it looks nice and smooth. I'm gonna make a layer here for our fill and set the outline layer as a reference as well. See, we get another prompt again for vector or pixel. We definitely want a vector. Now I'll make another layer here actually to hold my 3D colors. And that way it's separate from my actual fill. That helps if you ever want to manipulate like all the grays in your 3D to be a little bit darker or something. It'll allow you to edit that without messing with any of the fill colors. And once again, your layer maintenance over here is definitely all preference. I like to keep things separate in case I need to modify all my fills down the road or all my 3Ds down the road. I like to have you know, similar entities all on the same layer and that way nothing kind of gets cluttered or ends up overlapping and you have to manually redo a bunch of stuff. I'll even go as far to probably put my details on a separate layer as my fill. And I can always combine them later, but this way they're at least separate for the time being. Now if I leave my reference layer on as I'm doing some of these extra layers, you can see it's filling this entire section. So you sometimes have to toggle your reference off. It's called release the reference. And then you'll actually be able to fill just as you anticipate. So there is a little bit of nuance there. Just mess around with it and get comfortable. I mostly see that come up when I'm using fills. That's because it's trying to fill the entire region of the outline rather than what you've actually already drawn on that layer. A couple more bubbles here and we're good to go. So I hope that sets up some of these tools and kind of my layer strategy for you guys. Definitely leave a comment below if you need some extra tips. There's a lot more letters to be had here in the whole alphabet. Let's get moving. We got all three designs finished up. Can't wait to see that lime green and yellow combo on the throwy, and then the bright red outline to the tan gold on the cursive sprite. Both of those are gonna look great across the chest of a hoodie. And then I'm going big as a 24 by 24 full color print for the alphabet. You would not believe how long it took to get all those colors and details added in. The posters are off to a shop in Germany, but I'm having the hoodies made here in Denver. Let's go see them get printed. We're over here at the Artist Proof Collective Shop. A huge shout out for letting me film the process. Both my designs are gonna start off with a solid white layer. This will give all the other colors in design a great base to work off of. Each color on the design is printed through a really fine mesh. Those colors are separated one by one onto each individual screen. This is a great example of how each solid color of the vector file is represented screen by screen. As the first set of prints are coming around, the adjustment knobs that you see being turned right now are used to make sure each color lines up perfectly with the next. During setup, these will get tweaked to make sure the final image is perfect. I always seem to get some new color combo ideas as the partial prints come around. The screen colors will progressively get darker layer by layer, with the final being the black outline.
Now these inks are still wet coming off the press. Each hoodie gets dropped on this conveyor dryer where it gets baked at a couple hundred degrees. That makes sure all those inks are perfectly cured. Gotta love the look of a tall stack of hoodies. The posters have arrived. I don't know why this box size caught me by so much surprise. I was expecting something big and square, not all rolled up. What happened to the color? Double-sided, baby. the shop, pick up the hoodies and the poster. <laughs> <laughs>